This interview is part of the History Heard project. The content of this interview may be used for historical research. However, no part of the video itself may be reproduced without the express written permission of an authorized representative of History Heard or Mark Thompson. Today is January 7, 2010 at 9 a.m. This is an interview with Mark Thompson in Longboat Key, Florida. He was born on March 25th, 1953 in New Haven, Connecticut. So, um, as a journalist, you have done some amazing things, and um, you started out just as a regular journalist like anyone else. It's a really difficult business to get um, so advanced in so quickly, but you did. So what was that about? I mean, what was that like? I'm sorry. Well, when I got out of school in 1975, my sense was journalism, like any career, is a ladder. Right. And a lot of my friends said, oh, I want to go right to the top of the ladder right away. And I never, I never did that. I was a little nervous about it. So I went to my hometown weekly paper, actually, in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, a small weekly, 4,000 circulation. Mm -hmm. Worked there for a couple of years, had fun, and then went to a small daily in Michigan. Worked there for less than a year, 362 days to be exact. Not that I... <laughs> wanted to leave. Not that you counted or yeah. anything. <laughs> and I was lucky, you know, you make your own kind of luck, but that paper was owned by a Texas paper that was looking for somebody to cover Washington. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of knew me. And so then I went to Washington on behalf of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And then since I've been in Washington since 1979, more than 30 years now, I slugged away at the Star-Telegram in Washington for uh, seven years. And then I went to the Knight Ritter chain, the late lamented Knight Ritter chain, which included the Bradenton Herald, right. the Miami Herald, the Tallahassee Democrat, and some other Florida papers, as well as the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Detroit Free Press, and the San Jose Mercury News, where I worked for eight years, primarily covering the military before I went to time in 1994. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, wrote the article about the um, Bell Textron helicopters right around the time that the movie Silkwood was coming out. Mm. And the movie um, is about how a girl is is exposing these um, this corruption in a major business, and there they possibly um, kill her. And so, did you ever were you ever afraid by that? No, I mean I have flown in a lot of Bell helicopters in a lot of places around the world, both before and after I wrote that series mm -hmm. of articles. I mean, it was much tougher early on in my career when I was covering cops. And right. your life would get threatened more often covering <laughs> cops and covering a big industry. Um, there was a lot of anger when I wrote that series in the Fort Worth paper about the problems with the Bell helicopters, and they kicked our boxes out of their plants. They couldn't put new right. Star Telegrams in the newspaper, and they wouldn't talk to me. But I never uh, thought it would come to anything that serious. And in fact, you know... I still have friends at that company, and we still communicate. So, I mean, there's always that sense of foreboding before you produce a, a major piece, and you're nervous if you got everything right or all the ducks lined up. There's a lot more of that kind of anxiety about your own performance as a journalist than there is about, yikes, what's going to happen to me? Because once you produce a series like that that ends up being you know, reported on the AP, CBS, and New York Times all around the country, that sort of adds to your invulnerability, unlike Karen Silkwood, who was sort of an insider person. Right. As a journalist, you're sort of saying, hey, look what I found. <laughs> you're not, you know, you're not working on the inside, you're sort of Mr. Outside. And I think that gives most journalists a cloak that uh, a lot of inside folks don't have. Like you said, the newspaper also must have been not too pleased with you since they were losing subscriptions and then also Bell Textron wouldn't have been too happy about it either. So did you ever feel like you were kind of caught in between or anything? No, because to the contrary, um, the newspaper was strongly supportive of me. The president of Bell wrote a very snarky letter to the publisher of the Star-Telegram and said, oh. we think this is terrible, this is outrageous, how can you say such things about our great homemade product? And the publisher wrote back and basically said, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> this is good journalism, what you have said is wrong, leave our reporter alone, we stand by his story. There was, you know, uh, Fort Worth, like lots of cities, is really a small town, and especially at the higher levels, lots of people know everybody else, mm -hmm. and there was lots of overlapping of Bell Helicopter Textron, the Star Telegram, mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, some people in the paper said, oh, gee, you know, this is a five-day series, you're hammering this hometown company, did you really have to do it over five days? Right. Couldn't have been three days, or maybe one day, or maybe 15 minutes, but basically that was the sort of... Um, yeah. criticism we engendered. It wasn't, God, we shouldn't have done right. this. Imagine, as you're investigating the um, design flaws, 
that the story would end up being a Pulitzer Prize winning story? No, I mean, uh, for the Fort Worth paper in Washington, I covered a, a lot of what I covered was the military. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of military stuff then and now is made in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. So I'd write about Bell helicopters, General Dynamics F-16s, harm missiles made by TI, just because a lot of our readers' livelihoods depended on these weapons, mm -hmm. and they wanted to know how many is the Pentagon buying? Why aren't they buying more? Who are they going to sell them to overseas? So I'd cover stories like that all the time. And in fact, I came down here to Tampa to fly in an F-16 while I was working in the Star Telegram, which was great fun. But you never, when you're working on a story, you go, God, this is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I never thought, oh, this will win a big prize or anything. That wasn't why I did it. Um, I mean, the, just the, the key thing about that series of stories was helicopters kept crashing and everybody on them was dying. And finally, there was a survivor. The first time in 250 people aboard the helicopters, there was that survivor. We tracked him down. We interviewed him. He said, I wasn't doing anything wrong. So all of a sudden, you had a, an eyewitness to this flaw, which we had never had before in 20 or 30 years of flying these helicopters. And that made for very powerful journey. What did it journey. feel like when you found out about winning a Pulitzer Prize? And what was that like? Well, I was, you know, I wasn't in Texas. I was in Washington right. in a three-person bureau. And um, we knew they were coming out that day. Someone had told me the day before, you should come down to Fort Worth today. And I said, why? I said, well, you might win a Pulitzer. I said, well, if you tell me I've won, I'll be there. <laughs> but as long as you say might, I'm not going. Because I get there and the might, I mean, right. you know, what a drag to fly back home. So... Um, my colleague came and grabbed me because I was walking the hallways. So I was a little nervous. Right. And he says, you won. You won the top one. You know, we won because it's awarded to the paper, mm -hmm. you know, the right. public service Pulitzer. And so that was very gratifying. The next day I went down to Fort Worth and uh, celebrated in the newsroom. It was kind of weird because they had all celebrated the day it was announced. They brought a band in. There was champagne. And everybody got a $250 bonus, which made me the most <laughs> popular guy in the newsroom. The next day I went down and they did it all again. So, so that was great fun.